Do you think uh, we were talking about the the new alliance, uh, Britain, Australia and uh, America, and you also referred to those people carefully thinking in Washington about how to build alliances to counter this uh, and what have you. Would that have caused anything of a reset in Beijing's thinking at all? You know, here are the Brits of all people joining with us in a serious way again. This little place called Australia that they're pretty contemptuous of, and we bought that on ourselves in a military sense because we haven't taken it seriously. Suddenly we look like we are, but that you know that's a story yet to be fully unfolded. Would there have been any reset at, at the appearance that maybe this alliance approach is beginning to work in their thinking about Western declinism? I think we should watch carefully how things uh, evolve uh, over the coming months. Uh, looking ahead to the Winter Olympics uh, in Beijing next year. There's a new ambassador uh, in Washington uh, who has a distinctly different style from his predecessor. It's not, I think, a a straight uh, and unbending road to conflict. Uh, And the Chinese uh, uh, leadership elite, uh, for all its flaws, is not stupid. Liu He uh, is one of the key advisors uh, to uh, Xi Jinping. I've known him for many years. He's a highly intelligent man with a very good understanding of the United States. So I think one of the the reassuring things about the world that I see today is that there is an awareness of, of risk on the Chinese side. And they know that if they were to get this wrong, uh, if they were to risk a premature move on on Taiwan and lose, it would be game over. And, and that's really an extremely important thing to bear in mind. Just in the uh, in the last few days, we've had some very interesting discussions here at the Hoover Institution about the defense of Taiwan and how exactly we can deter China. Uh, and the uh, analogy of a porcupine is one that I heard mm. used. If you make Taiwan enough of a porcupine, uh, make it difficult enough uh, from the vantage point of Beijing, then you might just succeed in deterring what is a relatively risk-averse political elite. China hasn't fought many wars. Uh, really, uh, it hasn't fought a, a war since uh, its, it, its showdown with Vietnam, uh, which is so long ago that I was a teenager. Uh, so it's not as if they have battle-hardened troops uh, ready to take on uh, even the Taiwanese, uh, much less the US, uh, and its allies. So I, I sense that there is a lot to be gained from the kind of diplomatic moves that produced AUKUS in the same way that I think the Quad is a very, very important signal that the US and Japan are closer together than they have ever been. And India, which remember was a thorn in the side of the United States during Cold War I, India is now increasingly seen as as an ally. These are really important signals to Xi Jinping that he's blown it. Because let's face it, he has. You could subtitle Xi Jinping's foreign policy over the last uh, decade as how to lose friends and alienate people. Who exactly are Chinese China's allies at this point? Uh, Let's think North Korea. Mm, Yes. Uh, (laughs) Venezuela. Oh, great. Uh, Who else have we got? Oh, Russia. Well, if you think Vladimir Putin can be relied upon in a crisis over Taiwan, then you know pretty much nothing about Russian history. Although the uh, the, the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China are very close right now uh, to the point of joint military exercises, if I was Xi Jinping, I wouldn't trust Vladimir Putin further than I could throw him. Because from Putin's point of view, nothing would be better than for the US and China to fight a big war and inflict significant damage on one another, leaving him uh, sitting on the sidelines with that uh, wintry smile that he likes occasionally to wear. So I, I don't think China has a whole lot of diplomatic uh, options out there. In fact, it looks increasingly isolated. And why not? Think of it. Uh, first, you start a pandemic, a kind of massive version of the Chernobyl disaster. Then you deny that it was your fault. You go on Twitter and try to claim that the Americans brought the virus to Wuhan. Nobody believes you. Then you tell your diplomats, it's time to do wolf warrior diplomacy. You piss everybody off, even the French. I mean, they've done a lot to isolate themselves. We didn't actually have to do that much. 
so my sense is that this all makes it harder and harder for Xi Jinping to contemplate uh, a really decisive uh, coup de main uh, against Taiwan. And that's good because we want to deter him. We, we don't want this war to happen. We do not want even a Cuban Missile Crisis to happen because it would be extremely risky and, and, and nerve wracking as the Cuban Missile Crisis was. So yeah, more of the same as my advice to the Biden administration, keep on working on this diplomatic theme. Uh, it's certainly getting through to Beijing. They know that this reduces their room for maneuver quite significantly. Just, uh, that, and that's reassuring, and I, 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 it all makes perfect sense to me. The, the Chinese people themselves, one of the things about repressive regimes is that usually they've uh, sown the seeds of their own collapse uh, in many ways. But what we've never seen before is the extraordinary capacity to uh, eavesdrop on your citizens. You know, 400 million closed circuit televisions, face recognition, point systems for newborns you add to or have subtracted from during your lifetime, which have determined what internet speed you'll have and who you can marry and whether you get a job, presumably. That is extraordinary control. Um, and I just wonder how you think that plays out. You know, the people I know who, who have lived and worked or even still in China today, so you pick up the sort of massive change in the, in the attitude of the Chinese people towards Westerners to the level of uh, women saying, no, we can't gather with you anymore. You're now the enemy, the, the sort of anecdotal stuff that I hear um, uh, in, a, in a social club or social setting or a sporting setting or whatever. How do we read the Chinese masses who are cut off to a surprising degree, uh, who are surveilled and policed in a way that is quite chilling and not a way that any of us would want to live, uh, at the same time as presumably many of them have had a taste of a better way of life and despite the restrictions on their access to the internet and what have you, are aware that uh, the West remains a much better sort of style of uh, place to live in. How does that play out in your view? Well, I think you have to draw a distinction between the educated middle class, which has had some uh, exposure to the Western world and and the the laboring masses who still remain quite cut off and uh, and for whom uh, the uh, the environment is essentially a, a Chinese uh, a communist a nationalist environment. That is what they see, whether it's on uh, social media or on state television. And uh, that uh, wider mass of the population, I think, is is pretty uh, positive about uh, the regime, nationalistic in its outlook, and pleased with all that Xi Jinping says he's doing to reduce corruption and inequality. Amongst more educated uh, uh, Chinese, there's a great deal more ambivalence because they are seeing meaningful restrictions on uh, their freedom uh, and threats to their uh, property rights. Uh, after all, Marx was not wrong about everything, John. Marx said that uh, the growth of the bourgeoisie was always followed by an appetite for property rights, and that led in turn to an appetite for a rule of law, and that's what authoritarian regimes uh, tend not to want to hand over, and that's why bourgeois revolutions happen. Well, China has a bourgeoisie, arguably the biggest in history, produced in the shortest space of time. And uh, when you meet uh, those Chinese who benefited from the policies of opening up that began with Deng Xiaoping, uh, they've made a lot of money, in many cases, a staggering amount of money. What do they want to protect it? From whom? From the party and its ability to confiscate uh, with a mere accusation of, of corruption or some other malfeasance, the, the, the hard earned riches of the Chinese bourgeoisie. So I think it's important to recognize that for the, the great Chinese middle class, there's a lot to worry about. That's why such a large proportion of them were contemplating emigration, uh, according to survey data from just a few years ago. Well, now that option is much, much harder to, to exercise. Uh, so I, I think it's it's important to recognize how ambivalent the, the Chinese middle class, the educated middle class, is about Xi Jinping. But he can certainly count on the masses, as far as, I, as, far as we can tell. 
Uh, and I think when it comes to nationalism, we begin to see that that's the way she can keep the middle class on board. I mean, they don't believe in communism. They definitely don't believe in Xi Jinping thought. The masses may believe in it, but the elite does not want to study Xi Jinping thought. But if you press their buttons on nationalism, if you press the Han Chinese nationalist button, you'll get a response from even the highly educated Chinese who spent time in the West. I think that's what Xi Jinping is gambling on to keep the party in power. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe, and join the conversation.